It's the SNL Hall of Fame podcast with your host, Jamie Dew. Chief Librarian, Thomas Senna. And featuring Matt Ardill. And now, Curator of the Hall, Jamie Dew. Thank you so much, Doug Nance. It is great. No, it is fantastic to be here with you all this week inside the SNL Hall of Fame. Before you come on inside, I've got the door wide open for you here. Just take a look down at your feet. There's a mat there. Wipe them. The SNL Hall of Fame podcast is a weekly affair. Each episode, we take a deep dive into the career of a former cast member, host, musical guest, or writer, and add them to the ballot for your consideration. That's how we play the game. It's really quite simple. You tune in, you listen to who we're nominating, and then you decide whether or not they belong inside the Hall of Fame by voting when voting opens. And voting will open, in this case, around the 11th of December, when we get into the roundtable discussions and whatnot. But for now, uh, I won't waste your time with that information. I think we should get right into Matt's Minutia Minute because I'm excited about this week's episode. In fact, when I first launched this podcast, this was one of the pilot episodes I recorded. It was with Matty Price and it was covering Rosie Schuster. And that's what we're going to do again this week. We are going to have Thomas this time, though, sit in conversation with our friend Maddie Price and have a great conversation about Rosie Schuster and whether or not she belongs inside the SNL Hall of Fame. Like I said before, though, let me not uh, give you any more information at this point, an information dump. Let's go right into Matt's information dump in his Minutia Minute Corner. Hey, Matt, are you excited about this one? Let's go. Jamie, oh, this is going to be a fun one. Uh, this I am so excited. I grew up watching her dad on TV. Me and too. It was old radio programs. Um, yeah. Rosie Schuster is a comedy icon from a family of comedy icons responsible for a lot of things I love. Okay. Tell me about them. Hey, Rosie Schuster, bit of a mystery, height unknown, born June 19th, 1950. Whoa, no height. Rosie was born and raised in my town of Toronto. She is the child of Canadian comedy royalty Frank Schuster, for whom there is a Toronto street named after, and uh, is one of my earliest comedy memories. That said... She's not just the child of comedy royalty. She's also the the cousin of Joe Schuster. You know, the Joe Schuster, like the Superman Joe Schuster. Remember that Canadian Heritage Minute where, uh, you know, Lois says, oh, find out what your cousin Frank thinks. Well, that was Frank Schuster of Wayne and Schuster, father of Rosie. Uh, Rosie was followed home by a strange little fellow during her junior high years named Lorne in order to meet her dad. And uh, I mean, really, for our American listeners, these dudes were serious comedy royalty. I mean, you had a teenager following another teenager home just in the hopes to meet her father. That's a little weird. Yeah. I would agree. Her aunt Geraldine, uh, this is my personal connection to the Schuster family, which I only found out about from my uncle last night. Her aunt Geraldine Schuster uh, went to Juilliard and as part of her exams, played my grandfather's sonatina for piano as part of her exams. I did not know that. So technically, I am within six degrees of separation, not just from Rosie, but Frank. And Joe Schuster. Holy shit. I am having a nerd fantasy come true right now. And Lorne. You're close to Lorne, too. Before moving south to start a little project close to our hearts, she and Lorne started on the CBC with a show called 
Hart and Lorne, where they first worked with Dan and Gilda. They followed this by a stint in L.A. writing for The Lily Tomlin Show. Right. I remember that. Okay. After leaving SNL, she wrote for Broadway, uh, including a project for Gilda called Gilda Live. That was at the Winter Garden Theater. She co-wrote that along with Michael O'Donohue, Marilyn Miller, Alan Zwiebel, and Annie Beats. The production was directed by one of the founding members of Second City, improv innovator and Oscar-winning director, Mike Nichols. Wow. She produced a three-volume series for the CBC called Wayne and Rosie Schuster's Legacy Series, along with writing several scripts for MGM, Warner Brothers, and Orion. She has written for Bob and Margaret, a very weird little animated Canadian TV series about British expats, one of whom is a podiatrist. She also wrote for The Larry Sanders Show, Carol and Company, and the Superman 50th Anniversary Special. She has a small part in the Blues Brothers as the waitress and is an inductee into another prestigious museum, the Museum of Broadcasting. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, that was great work, as always. Uh, what do you say we take it downstairs now and go and listen to our friends Matty Price in conversation with our very own Thomas Senna? Wonderful, Jamie and Matt. We appreciate you as always. And today we are talking about, we're actually going to go a little blast from the past. We're going to go to the original seasons, kind of where it all started, the genesis of Saturday Night Live. Somebody who was there, basically, she, I'm sure this person, I'm sure she saw firsthand the the beginning, the, uh, the uh, deliberations, how the show was created. Uh, of course, we were talking about Rosie Schuster today on the SNL Hall of Fame podcast. And with me to discuss Rosie Schuster is somebody who's been here before. I believe this is Maddie Price's fourth time on the SNL Hall of Fame. And so Maddie, uh, Maddie's been a guest for uh, with us for Paul Simon, Candace Bergen, and Gilda Radner. So this era of SNL, definitely in his wheelhouse. So I'm really happy that Maddie's able to join us. Maddie, how you doing? I'm good. Thank you. That was a super nice way of uh, saying that I'm very old, <laughs> which I really appreciate. The early seasons are well in his wheelhouse. As He's the say. point person for the uh, for yeah, the genesis, for the old wild. stuff, for the. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Look, I we could t I, could, I you know what? I'm going to take somebody new next time you send me. I'll talk about day. I'll talk. All right. About so something. we'll go early 80s then. Well, I'll send Can you, you something later? from the early 80s. Give me a, I'll do, I'll do a Punky Johnson episode. Let's I don't do it. care anymore. All right. No, he's, so Maddie wants everybody to know that he's not just, his, his wheelhouse isn't just. I'm not dead. Older SNL. <laughs> <laughs> but he's very informed and big fan just of sick, older I'm SNL. This is, yeah, we didn't do this on purpose. I swear it's just. No, he's actually... I know. And you know what? That's okay. I look, I, these are all great seasons and I especially do. I do love looking at where this show kind of started. And, uh, Rosie Schuster is. Uh, uh, sort of as, uh, like we'll see kind of how this episode comes out, but I do think it's like sort of an important link in the chain of like mm -hmm. what makes it hell, well, um, for many reasons. So yeah, we can, we'll, I'm happy to talk about it. For sure. Yeah. And if you, if you want to hear Maddie talk about current day SNL, he will, he has been a guest, a panelist on our round table episodes where he gets to give his right. opinions on like more current cast members and hosts and everything like that. So he's versatile. But we really appreciate him, again, being our old person um, to come here and uh, reminisce about the late 70s with us. So they, they thank you, Maddie, so much. <laughs> uh, so you joined us, actually, to talk about – this is interesting to me. So you talked about a musical guest, a host, a cast member, and now a writer. So we actually get to get your – uh, take on like the different aspects. Yeah. So I'm, I've well. hit for the cycle here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The cycle. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think you might be the first one. I don't know that Kirsten Turnbull, though she is a five timer. I don't know that she's hit for the cycle. So congratulations hey, I'll uh, take on it. that. Well, your certificate will be in the mail and okay. <laughs> talking about writers is probably a little trickier because, because we're not as involved in seeing the process of a sketch 
Uh, we just see the results, so it's hard to get like a perfect read on their exact contributions. But Rosie, Rosie Schuster, was definitely an important figure in SNL history and in comedy. And uh, in fact, she comes from an entertainment family, right, Maddie? Yeah, so uh, she is from Toronto, which is where Lauren Lipowitz, nay Michaels, uh, was also from. And in fact, they were uh, they were married through the pretty much the entire original run of the show. Their relationship ended, or they at least got uh, you know their marriage ended, kind of right around the time the original the original uh, run of the show ended. But they had known each other much longer. She she is like I said, she's she's a Torontonian. And does come from a fairly well-known, at least in Canada, fairly well-known entertainment family, uh, the Schusters. People in the U.S. would know her father, Frank Schuster, if they were watching The Ed Sullivan Show. Mm -hmm. So Frank Schuster and Johnny Wayne were a comedy duo, and they were a sketch, they were specifically a sketch duo. They did not do, they were not a comedy team like Bob and Ray. They wrote sketches and performed them. They had a they had actually like a bit of a little repertory company with them, uh, Sylvia Lenick and a few other really great performers. And they, in fact, set a record. They they were guests on the Ed Sullivan Show more times than any other than any other act. And their sketches were great, and they were very much of their time, kind of the the late fifties, early sixties. They were very uh, literary kind of sketches. So they wrote like their most famous sketches are like they wrote a sketch about uh, the death of Julius Caesar. That's like a simultaneous sort of takeoff on Shakespearean kind of stuff, but also really poking fun at like a lot of intricate jokes about Latin and stuff like that. Kind of the most famous joke that they wrote was uh, they did Julius Caesar as like a murder mystery, like almost like a Columbo Mm. murder mystery where he's investigating who killed Julius Caesar. And so it's like a hard boiled detective slant on Julius Caesar and he comes into a bar and he says, give me a Martinez. And the guy, the bartender says, don't you mean a martini? And he says, well, if I wanted to, I'd have ordered two. And it's like a very, it's, that's the kinds of jokes that they wrote. These very nerdy, you had to have been to school and taken Latin for that joke to kind of hit you the right way. Right. They wrote, they wrote a Shakespearean baseball sketch. They wrote like, they, they did a lot of this kind of, crossover stuff where there was like there was like a higher education element to it that kind of powered through the the comedy and made it work we saw Um, a lot of that type of humor like you know in british it's kind of like british humor and we saw a lot of that seep into like canada and sctv had elements of that but it's almost like strikes me as very british what they don't have is that monty python kind of anarchy irreverence Mm. to it it's yeah, it's much more I think Goon Show is probably like a good example, but even still, like I think what the Brits had was they're a little meaner and these guys are a little more Canadian, which is why Ed Sullivan loved them. I think they're just like pretty harmless fun. And they went on to kind of repackage those sketches as sort of television specials in Canada. So, you know, Wayne and Schuster are like about as famously Canadian comedians as you could get. And Rosie, which is how her friends would pronounce it, grew up in Forest Hill, went to Forest Hill High School, which is where my mother went to high school a couple of years before her, and where Lorne Michaels, who was Lorne Lipowitz at the time, also went to high school a couple of years, sort of concurrently with my with my mom. He's a couple of years older than her. Oh, he wow. was born in 44. My mother was born in 46. And Rosie was born in 50. So the way the story goes is that because Frank Schuster was this like huge comedy figure and because Lorne knew that his daughter went, but you know, went to the school and was much younger, like she would have been sort of like a grade nine, 10 person when he was kind of in his final year of high school, but he followed her home because he wanted to meet her dad. He just was, I think he was a bit of a comedy. I think the one thing about SNL that is that Lorne and most of those guys are, they're kind of comedy nerds, right? Mm. And before that was really a thing. And so I think I, my guess is that the relationship started because he just wanted to meet her father and just was hanging out with her. And she was like much younger than him. Right. So I don't think it would have started as necessarily like a romantic thing. Um, he was just but trying it's to network. Weird. Like yeah. you saw yeah. Lauren's networking skills, even, even at that age, he was trying to oh, network I, with I Rosie think, and meet yeah. some celebrities, meet, meet a comedy, some comedy heroes of his. I mean, that is essentially the same story as Judd Apatow. 
in terms of like being a kid who just loves comedy and wants to go meet all these heroes. Like, mm-hmm. uh, so, and you know, and so they, and I guess like at some point that blossomed into a romantic relationship. They wound up, they were married in 1971 and they were not just married. They worked together right, almost right from the start. Again, probably no surprise to people listening to this show, but the kind of predecessor to SNL is a, is a Canadian sketch comedy show called the heart and Lauren terrific hour. Uh, which Lauren was the co-producer uh, or co-creator of with um, a Canadian writer, um, Hart Pomerantz. And like to further complicate all of these relationships, uh, my father was actually a semi-regular on that show. My father's best friend was one of the writers on the show, Alan wow. Gordon, along with Rosie was a writer on the show. So was Hart Pomerantz. So was his younger brother, Earl Pomerantz, who really was like really good friends with both my parents. They went to university together Earl went on to write probably some of the most famous sitcom episodes ever. He created a a show called Best of the West, which is like a real cult sitcom classic. He also wrote, like, he wrote the Goldfish episode of The Cosby Show. He wrote really famous sitcom. He wrote Cheers episodes. He wrote, like, if it was like a big show in the 80s and 90s, he, he was the executive producer of Major Dad. He created that show. Like, lots of people who were kind of around at the time then went on to like more stuff. Lauren and Rosie took that to the States and started, you know, and became sort of the nucleus of SNL, I guess. Yeah. And they, both of them were involved uh, a little bit in, uh, in laughing as well. I know Rosie was kind of guest writer. I don't know if she was officially credited. Oh, was she? Okay. Uh, I know that they did work with Lily Tomlin too, right? Mm -hmm. In there where they were doing, producing some of her specials. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So, and I tried to get a sense, you know, my dad was just a, Former. So he he didn't really have a sense of the writer's room. But one thing, I have seen a few episodes of Heart and Lauren Terrific Hour, and there are a number of sketches that are like a couple just talking about something in bed. And I feel like that's a that's a real trademark kind of sketch that then they did quite a lot of those on SNL too. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, you know, my mom remembered her from high school. And I said, well, what was she like? And she said, oh, well, first of all, she was super pretty. And she was not sort of cliquey or stuck up about it. She was like a super popular girl just because she was nice, which I thought was like very indicative of like why they could get people to work with them. Right. Yeah. They weren't fake. I don't think I think Lauren Michaels is a lot of things, but I don't think he's, you know, in 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 disingenuous or whatever. Like, I think he's not a, a slick producer guy. He's like he actually means it. Exactly. He never seemed I don't know. I never got the impression, especially in the 70s, that he was too much of a hard ass especially at the beginning it almost seemed yeah. like he he was really good about about making friends and uh, getting people to trust him especially like they trusted him yeah. when johnny carson said you can't air my reruns anymore nbc trusted lorne and dick ebersall but they trusted right. lorne to be part of that process you know and he was just a young punk young canadian <laughs> and he, yeah. he he was a charming enough and and savvy enough to to have people trust him i think that's always been a gift of his and it sounds like rosie was cut from similar cloth yeah and i think like you know we can't know these people we only know their work and and even then like you said with writers it's very hard to know you know in an active writers room where there's a dozen or more people and they're all pitching at you know helping each other it's never clear exactly who's responsible for what but I, I do think it's not like a crazy leap to say she was probably like a, a nice person who was who was easy, you know, nice to work with and like not a terrible kind of, you know, difficult person to be with. She seems to have partnered up with a lot of different people, including, you know, primarily Ann Beats. I think in the beginning, it's like they, mm-hmm. they seem to be like partners and nobody has a bad word to say about Ann Beats. Jeez. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Okay, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So that was kind of my that was my little voyage of discovery about her wow. just on a personal side, and then and then I started looking at the sketches. Obviously, leading up to this episode, uh, we had a chance to revisit uh, a lot of uh, Rosie Schuster's sketches. Whether she was principal writer or she, you said she teamed up a lot with various folks and beats. Uh, Marilyn Suzanne Miller, she teamed up with uh, a bit here and there. Um, so yeah. just kind of revisiting stuff, like how would you describe Rosie's comedic voice and point of view, like and maybe how. Did that fit in with SNL and what they were trying to do uh, around that time? I was trying to look for that because I think it's always interesting to try to, and you know, again, you don't know what little bits and bobs people Mm -hmm. threw into sketches, but if you look at the ones that she is sort of credited for, the major ones really are 
at least from the original run, are the nerds. That's kind of the biggest sketch that seems like she has the most ownership of it. What a becoming housecoat, Mrs. Hoopner. Oh, flattery will get you everywhere, Todd. You kid must be starving. Let me get you some miniature marshmallow. Bag Thank you, Mrs. Hoopner. <laughs> Now, which one of you is the new president of the chess club? Oh, Bob, they don't pick till Friday. And then on the Uncle Roy Buck Henry sketches. They're they're kind of the major ones from that mm -hmm. from that era. And then there's some other ones that, that you asked me to look at, which I also think are really interesting. But the thing about those sketches, especially the nerds, is they have a kind of sweetness to them, and they the sketches are about regular people. They're not really high concept sketch ideas. I don't see her name being attached to a lot of fake ads or like there's not a lot of her stuff doesn't seem to want to need to be satire. It's character stuff. I don't know if that yeah, makes sense. Yeah. That yeah. feels like what she's contributing is, you know, there is there's uh, SNL is a lot of different things. It has a lot of different strengths. Her strengths are not on the weekend update lampoon, the day's events side of it. And they're not necessarily on the, take something and make it ridiculous and stretched out and stupid and goofy. They really feel more like, Hey, people are funny. And when we can make them interact, they can be funny together. So I think that, you know, t there's like a kind of a humanism to her stuff uh, that may, that I think, you know, and she's not the only one that I think can do that, but I think she does it seems to do it extremely well. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. That was definitely evident with, with the nerds. Uh, you mentioned uncle Roy, which, you know, two almost, diametrically opposed <laughs> kind of two sides of the same coin things, baby. but yeah both, no it's slice yeah. of life in yeah. different sorts yeah. of ways yeah. uh are, definitely yeah. definitely likes putting children in peril she really cackles mm -hmm. at the idea of especially little girls being se uh, sexually uh, in danger she thinks that's really funny to play around with and like and uh, it's stuff you watch those uncle roy sketches you cannot imagine somebody doing those sketches today impossible right yeah. and like they're really funny and they're really like really deaf in terms of like what real victims of that kind of stuff might be going through <laughs> but like the idea that she's able to sort of be you know she's outrageous but within the con the sort of confines of character outrageousness as opposed to like conceptual outrageousness yeah, and with those, with that Uncle Roy sketch, like of course, I don't know, a lot of people listening don't need a reminder of what what the Uncle Roy sketches were. But Buck Henry played a character named Uncle Roy, who who had who was babysitting who is not their uncle nieces. It's not yeah, <laughs> Uncle Roy in quotes because he's just uh, he's, he's a just some friend family of their friend. Yeah. yeah, who's 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 babysitting um, the the two little girls played by Lorraine and Gilda, and yes. he has quite frankly terrible thoughts about like you can and motives and intentions and you can see that play out but i've seen rosie i've heard rosie explain her point of view as far as writing these sketches and what she said was she explained the sketches as being okay because they don't have a victim she said they don't have a victim everything right. bad happening is just in uncle roy's mind rosie said this uh, but right. the children it's love uncle roy so but, much yeah, it's it's very clear that he would never actually harm those children. Yeah. But he but he's not going to actually put them in any harm. And in fact, he everything he's doing they think is really fun. Mm -hmm. From their point of view, it's all hilarious and a great time for little girls. They're all playing pretend. Yeah, and they they did at the end, uh, I think it was maybe the final Uncle Roy that they that they did. Uh Jane plays the mom and thanks Roy <laughs> for watching them. And he, she says something to the effect of, It's a shame every family can't have an Uncle Roy. You're one in a million. And in her mind, it's like she meant there's not many people like you out there who are so right. willing to and help. He turns to the and camera and right. says, Oh, there's more of me than you might suspect. <laughs> I think those sketches are great. But I also, I also agree with you that they, 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 they thread a very fine line mm -hmm. in terms of why they're great. Yeah. Um, and I can uh, understand yeah. if people don't love them either, because in those situations, sure, in this specific sketch, there's no victim. It's only things are only happening right. in Roy's mind. I can see why people wouldn't like it, though, because in those situations, there often is a victim. So well, they yeah. got to be and like, you know, cognizant of that. But that wasn't Rosie's. If you hear Rosie explain it, she had a more, I guess, uh, innocent viewpoint of of those sketches. 
there's also always this thing of like, because the fact is that the Uncle Roy's, the sort of family friends who come over, that they are by, like statistically by far the more dangerous individuals in society, mm-hmm. as opposed to that horrendous Jim Caviezel movie that came out this summer where it's supposed to be like, you know, some international ring of criminals that are kidnapping children. That actually doesn't happen. Like human trafficking and, and abuse doesn't happen with people, strangers that you don't know. It happens actually with people you know and trust implicitly. Right. So you could argue that like by depicting it that way, using comedy to actually raise awareness of the fact that you can't just trust people on good faith. And sometimes people will seem nice, but in fact are not nice. And it's the question is, you know, by depicting it, are you making and making it funny? Are you making it okay? Are you providing excuses for it? Are you softening it? Whatever. I don't know the answer to that. My feeling is those sketches don't make me think that that's good or okay. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> it makes me think they're bad, but, yeah. but, but there was also a... makes me laugh at the sort of the same way you laugh at like, you know, something that you're not supposed to do, like laughing at a funeral or something like you're right. laughing because you know, you're not supposed to, and, and you know that it's bad. Yeah. Something else, another famous sketch that was actually, it might not seem like slice of life at first blush, but it was slice of life as far as Rosie is concerned, was the Fred Garvin male prostitute sketch. You see, ma'am, when a VIP like yourself Uh comes to Moline to do business, it's customary for the company to send a gal up to the room. Compliments of Great Lakes feed and grain. (laughs) And, well, since you're a gal, the company sent me, Fred Garvin, male prostitute. There's a story behind this. This was the one in season four, which I always thought it was wonderful sketch. I always thought it was a recurring character. They only did this once. Yeah. It's like a one-off, one of the more famous and beloved one-off sketches, I think, in the original years. But this was actually based on a bit that she and Dan would do, like Dan would do in their bedroom. He would jump on the bed and pose all like funny and sexy and use that voice. He would put on that Fred Garvin affectation and talk to Rosie that way. And that would make her laugh so hard. Oh, for sure. And by the yeah. way, we didn't even mention that Rosie, after she and Lauren split up, that she dated Dan Aykroyd. So that was like, that's like a, yeah, that's like I mean, a footnote I don't, yeah, to I, this. I don't want to necessarily, like, one of the things about, especially that original group, is that they all wound up dating each other. Sure. So, uh, you know, people work together in very close quarters and things happen. And, like, and, and again, I think it's because she was a genuinely beautiful and appealing person Mm -hmm. not because she was a conniving whatever like she's the the those relationships are probably you know born out of something like legitimate it seems like yeah definitely Um, so that's why i think that's just a footnote but she was with dan Aykroyd at a certain point and and this was something that he would do you can imagine that right oh yeah for sure for sure (laughs) because it's hilarious right and like his little poses on the bed and stuff are they're great. And coming up with a way to like put that into a sketch and have it be funny is terrific. And again, that's a great example of a sketch that seems on the surface of it is totally like silly and outrageous, but it's totally coming from a bunch of, you know, pretty solid character orientations, like the character that Margot Kidder plays and the character that, and that Fred Garvin character, they have dimensionality and depth to them and like way more than they need to have. Mm -hmm. for a sketch like that they could just be cutouts but like i kind of feel like there's a whole backstory on margot kidder working for this farm implements company as an executive and the only female executive and having to travel and be alone and away from her husband and this sort of matter of fact thing of like well when executives travel they get broads and you're a broad so we sent me and these well-intentioned uh uh, managerial types just like well we have a female executive Let's trying to find a male prostitute, like yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. but also like his relationship to the pimp and him trying to be a good prostitute and, and like really taking and really having, you know, having no aptitude for that work mm-hmm. is just so great. He's like, it's such a, the reason you think you've seen a bunch of them is it's such a fully formed character that feels so three dimensional that you're like, I must've seen him a bunch of times. 
That's such a good point. And I love the self-awareness. Fred Garvin does have self-awareness because it's almost he's like he's trying to reassure Margot Kidder's character that he is capable and he can please her and yeah. all of this stuff. So I just love the um, the lengths that he's going to, to to reassure her that he's a professional and that he, that he, he uh, knows what he's doing, satisfaction guaranteed, all of that. So, yeah, you're right. Like this is such a fully formed – fleshed out character that's that is why that's why i feel exactly why i feel like it is a recurring character even though it's not yeah he's got a great tagline right off the hop it's very yeah it's, he looks, it's kind of got everything you want out of an snl sketch right yeah yeah it's fantastic and we even, shouldn't even gloss getting middle and end which you know they don't always <laughs> it's hard to end a sketch man <laughs> it, yeah. it's only it's bonus points if they know how to end a sketch but i don't detract points if they don't if if they don't yeah. know how it's just so hard to end a sketch, but this one actually like you're right. Beginning, middle and end, uh, just a classic from, from the early days. And Rosie was like a big part in that. I mean, she took her a real life experience and fleshed out just a wonderful sketch. This is something that Rosie should be proud of. And we shouldn't gloss over the fact too. We had mentioned that she was behind the nerd sketches, but they were beloved they there was at least twelve of them that I can at least a dozen nerd sketches yeah, yeah. between seasons three and five. Those with Bill and Gilda, and they were super beloved. It tapped into something that and Jane people, Curtin, who is yeah. the unsung hero of those sketches. Jane Curtin's mom in those is so great. Yeah, it's really interesting to watch those develop. I had never seen the original original one where they're supposedly a band with Robert Klein and like they so the characters mm -hmm. came up first as just generic nerds and then they i guess they realized that they could you know that they wanted to know more about those characters but what's really cool to me is you say they were beloved beloved but it's actually probably not until the fourth or fifth one that's yeah it, that's, it's that's very a good it's a very organic belovedness they clearly are writing those sketches because they have affection for those people all of them and like the performers too but like they really like that scenario and like the way they've constructed those characters. And so they keep writing the sketches and it sort of takes a while, but eventually they get to the point where the minute they come out, the audience cheers the way they would cheer for mm -hmm. you know, other sort of recur other runners like Hans and Franz or church later or whatever. Like they have to earn it by just being good every time. Right. Yeah. And then, um, and they have they established goodwill with the audience, and you could tell by the end, like there's a there's a nerds nativity sketch, and there's not like jo a joke per second. There's like no. that sketch just kind of like fleshes out. There's a lot of setup. It, it's it really is a kind of a long sketch, but it's almost by that point it was like the second to last nerd sketch. By that point, it seems like they had so much goodwill with the audience that it was fine. Like yeah. they can just do a scene with the nerds and it doesn't have to be joke, 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 joke. And yeah. the audience is fine with it. They also, I don't know if this is the only sketch to ever do this, but there's basically true continuity through all of the sketches. Yeah. There's like a they narrative. Have, they have, there is an overarching narrative. If you watch them all, as I did today, characters recur, they come back and they, and they don't shy away from like acknowledging that, you know, when they bring back the Michael Palin, uh, music teacher, like, Everything that happened in the previous Michael Palin music teacher sketch is still part of the continuity. It feels like they just would look at the last one and go, okay, where do we want to take them from here? But they didn't forget about it. Like, I think a lot of other recurring sketches, they just, they're, they're totally episodic. I don't, I can't think of any, maybe the Coneheads, like, I can't think of too many that were runners where, like... Yeah, the Coneheads like, had, had an overarching theme of, like, getting back home. Right. But I think you could watch each Coneheads individually and not necessarily notice a narrative yeah, on their own. But I think it's yeah. there's clearly in a line like they clearly if you have been watching them all, you get more out of it. And I don't know, Maddie, if you if you uh, notice this and this is coming from Rosie, she said that she thought it was funny that the interaction between Todd and Lisa was predicated on how Bill and Gilda were getting along in real life at the time. Because I think they oh, that's cool. possibly were dating, and uh, you had mentioned yeah, that, that they back then um, a it lot of them dated each other. Predicated on Bill trying to crack, trying to make Gilda break. Either trying making Gilda fall. break, or sometimes there was frostiness between yeah. them if things weren't like great in real life. Yeah. I don't know if you caught on to any of that, but Rosie says that she could notice that in those sketches, in like how they would do it. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah, just how they interacted with each other. She she could tell how like if Bill and Gilda weren't getting along that week, she could tell in the nerd sketch uh, that they weren't. It was kind of yeah, it was kind of fascinating. But she's so good at world building, Rosie. I mean, just judging by some of these examples, she's very good at building characters and building a world and establishing like narratives and I think that's a that's a real talent as a writer. Yeah. Like I said, I think she's one of the few that really works from characters out as opposed to the other way around. And she doesn't. And she also, I mean, you know, I guess we're going to talk about it, but she, she's sort of the one that developed the, the church lady right. in strip into a concept for like, how do you take that? That was a character that Dana Carvey did in stand up. And so he had just had jokes that he would do, but he didn't have a frame to like hang the character on to make a sketch out of it. And she, I guess her role was to say, well, why don't you make it like a talk show? And then you can have people on and then you can sort of criticize them for not being, you know, that you're so much more sanctimonious than they are. And mm -hmm. that could be your, your shtick. So you, you get to have a rotating group of people come on every week, kind of like be themselves. You can have great real people and impressions, but you basically get to just like sit in judgment over every single person that comes on the, the show, which is a really good frame to hang that around. And so there's an example of taking a character that isn't coming from inside of her, but still like understanding how do I maximize this character and make it into something. I think it does always seem to come from, you know, that sort of more human approach to stuff. Yeah. I think Rosie is so synonymous with the first five seasons of SNL that a lot of people don't realize that she worked with Dana on these church yeah. lady sketches in season, season 12. And you're right. This was a Dana character. Uh, before SNL, she helped flesh it out, and she has the perfect summation. Uh, Rosie does. Uh, I had found something where she talked about like her vision of the church lady, and and this yeah. is just the perfect summation of what the church. She said the church lady would project her filthy erotomaniac imagination all over the poor hapless guest, whoever they were. She would basically verbally slime them with her own repressed garbage, and then she'd go to town shaming them. She had a black belt in shaming. And then she'd coyly suggest their behavior was the work of Satan. That's what Rosie right. said. That's exactly, right. that's how you describe the church lady sketches. That's the, that's the nugget that makes those work is she, that's really she's smart. repressed. Like it's all, it's all progression. It's all projection. Yep. It's all projection. Yeah. I never really thought about that way, but she's right. Yeah. That's really smart. First, we check in under a false name, probably Steve. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Then we slip a lute into Jesse's wine. <laughs> just to get her in the mood. Then we peel off Jesse's spandex pants and tube top. <laughs> then Jimmy has to explain how this has never happened to him before. <laughs> how long does that take, Tammy? Excuse me. Oh, um, I would say about five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. Okay, so we have some more time here. So then Jimmy, <laughs> a few more minutes. Yes, Jimmy preps the bed, and I guess uh, Jesse preps Jimmy. <laughs> she helped develop this character. She was only involved uh, really in season 12 of this character, but that was, I mean, that was where the important stuff happened. That's where the character building, a lot of the character building happened. Of course, Dana fleshed it out uh, so well. Yeah, I, mean, but... I don't know, you know, after she left, it doesn't seem like she left Lauren on really bad terms. Like I said, I think they broke up, but I don't think they, they no. hate each other. No, it didn't sound they, like it. Again, I'm just guessing, but my guess is that he had this character and, and none of the writers who were already on the show had a take that they liked. And maybe Lauren talked to her about it and said, and she said, oh, well, maybe, maybe I have a take on it. Like, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem so formal. You know what I mean? It's more like, I can help you. I can probably write something. You know, she worked on other people's material too. She worked on uh, the the It's Gary Shandling show also, which is another kind of fun thing that comes out of character, but also has like pretty outrageous stretches away from reality and stuff and like yeah, i definitely. think she, and larry sanders too so she she knew gary okay. shanley from there and she okay. worked a little bit on larry sanders which was classic wonderful show one of my all-time yeah. favorite shows yeah. honestly so yeah rosie had a, hand, a little hand in that and i think we talked about a lot of her slice of life kind of points of view and sketches and i a lot of uh, i had i have a few examples of she liked to kind of poke a little bit at like male ego and patriarchy and kind of things of that nature. She did have some satirical sensibility as far as that goes. Like when Lily Tomlin hosted an episode early in season one, and it was basically just taking the piss out of the male ego and a commentary on chauvinism. It was the, uh, 
yeah. what they call hard hats which was when actually the it was Lily Tomlin teaching the uh, female cast members how to cat call men well, who were scantily clad. Now, uh, when a cutie pie walks by, I want you to stretch your stuff, honey. When a cutie pie walks by, here's how you break the ice. Hey, 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 beef cakes. Hey, hey, beef cakes. Yeah, you. Come up here, baby. Do some squat jumps on this girder. Okay, I think I got him warmed up. You take over. Oh, hey, hey, wait a second. Permit me, sweetheart. <laughs> hey, hey, Dreamboat, what's the matter? A smile isn't going to cost you anything. No, 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 no. Now, you should have had that memorized, Jane. You should have had that memorized. Yes, they're all female construction workers. Yes. And it's a construction worker school. And so she's like, well, now it's time to learn how to make men feel bad about themselves. Yeah. Uh, and yes, I agree. And I think the same thing with there's a there's a, a mommy beer mm -hmm. commercial that she did later on, which is the same idea of like basically just taking masculinity and showing it up for how ridiculous it is. You know, there's some other sketches. There's one that's like a, a sort of a, a it's called Herstory episodes in Herstory, and one of the ones that she wrote is about um, Freud being unnaturally aroused by his daughter Anna, and like, I think she does have this thing where she's trying to point out that this fetish that men have for little girls and sort of very infantile behavior among women. Um, there's another one called Gidget Gets Shock Therapy that's talking about how obnoxious that idea of w grown women acting like little girls is. I think it's all kind of part of the same thing, which is her saying, this is ridiculous. <laughs> That Gidget goes to yeah. shock therapy yes. was was very much a, like a heavy handed, and that's not a bad thing. I'm not criticizing it, but yeah. it's very much yeah. heavy handed in, in that regard. As with Gilda Lorraine and Sissy Spacek was in right. that, it was basically like Jane comes on and identifies the three of them as grown women. So they're talking. So you see, you think they're little girls talking to each other, but Jane comes right. on and says these are grown women, even though they present it children as children, and they label them uh, as terminally cute. And she said, but there's a cure and it's shock therapy or there's a, it's called Gidget's disease. <laughs> yeah. So they're taking donations to help find like this cure, yeah. to raise money for Gidget's disease. And that's totally a commentary on like this, the type of woman, I guess, who, who's terminally cute, who speaks in a cutesy voice. And then maybe the type of men who are attracted to that. There was also a whole thing in the seventies in sort of men's magazines around women dressing as little girls, like dressing in little girl outfits and stuff and whether that was okay or not. And there was a lot of talk about how damaging that was to kind of the women's movement and, you know, schoolgirl stuff and all of that kind of stuff. And I think, I think all of that was kind of in the air in the culture. And I think the Jane Curtin part in that Gidget shock therapy thing is pretty much her directly speaking her own point of view, which is this is ridiculous and obnoxious. Really enough to make you want to puke your guts. Out. <laughs> And like, I don't think that that's somehow her just going, well, this is what the character would say. Like, I think that's, that seems like a direct statement from her, the right. Yeah, kind of a direct statement from Rosie. <laughs> we know who wrote that sketch is almost like Rosie saying that's how she views this. And if Rosie was trying to poke at the male ego a little bit with these sketches, there's a good, I think it probably worked because in that hard hat sketch that we were talking about, Belushi didn't want to do it because he said he felt objectified and he didn't want to parade around in short shorts and everything. So Dan Aykroyd actually took his place. That was originally going to be Belushi, uh, but he didn't want to yeah. do it because he felt objectified. And I bet there was part of Rosie that pumped her fist and was like, all right, see, you see? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, do you feel objectified? <laughs> <laughs> Is that so? Good. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I have news for you. Yeah. It's also <laughs> just an objectively hilarious sketch because yeah. Omelin is so into it and she's so funny in it. And they're all great, I think. Like, that's a really good. Like it, it does. Re I mean, it's we've now come to the point where I think, you know, there's been lots of commentary on catcalling and stuff, but like that feels like it was a bit ahead of its ahead of the curve. And 1975, you know, yeah, like quite nicely sort of sums up just how dehumanizing and shitty 
that behavior really is. And I like the fact that that sketch ends on a real down note where Dan Aykroyd's just crying. And like, he's just destroyed. There's no redemption for him. It's not happy. He's just crying. And the final line of the sketch is, oh, come on, man, it's only school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In a really weird way to end the sketch, which is just to say like, yeah, this sucks. It's terrible. Stop doing this. Yeah, but you don't feel sorry for him, especially if you're a woman who's been catcalled. No, exactly. Sure. You, no, you no, don't no, feel no, sorry that's for what him. I mean. It's, it's, not, it's not about him, you know, getting to feel better about himself. It's like literally about how this behavior is destructive and makes people feel shitty. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can do it. Yeah, that this that was an interesting point of view, especially in the mid seventies, for women to write comedy like that. You know, she and Ann Beats were were heavily involved in that sketch. Lily Tomlin, uh, a, a comedy legend, yeah. heavily involved. So, so I thought that was like a nice, uh, wonderful gem from those early seasons. There's a sketch in season four that's a one of a, a kind of a rare Lorraine Newman led sketch. It's this child psychiatrist that I thought was interesting. Lorraine Newman plays a five year old. <laughs> six-year-old girl who's yes who's also she a is a literal child psychologist as mm -hmm. in she's a psychologist who is a child yes yeah and i thought that was inter an interesting point of view and she she actually does a good job of getting to the root of the problems that this child's having with uh with their parents i thought that was just the, the, I, I thought that was super clever to cast lorraine as an actual child uh yeah. to help this family through their problems and she behaves childishly as well but she also has set, like some sense about her and it's almost like rosie's saying that children do have intuition in some ways too, which I thought was fascinating. Yeah. Plus I think Lorraine is the one that they had the longest relationship with uh, of the cast members. Cause I think they picked Lorraine up first from the groundlings. Like when they were in Los Angeles working, yeah. doing the and stuff. I know and Lauren so and Ebersol were in LA uh, formulating, crafting the show. So that does make sense. Lorraine would, would have been one of the first. Yeah. And, and I feel like the, they write for her, as well as anybody because she she didn't always get the best stuff to do and they they seem to understand how to use her really well mm -hmm. yeah in the Gidget one too that we had referenced lorraine is heavily involved in that one too so yeah, yeah. and even in there's she's in the almost i guess not quite the last but one of the very last nerds sketches which is the one where todd's running for student council yeah and she has a really good character in that it's a really fully formed character she's only in that one sketch but she's like one of the other classmates at school and I thought her performance in that nerds in that particular one was really good. Yeah, I thought she was good in that. And it would have been nice if, you know, we there were more folks like Ann Beats and, and Rosie Schuster who wanted to give Lorraine. I think Lorraine could have done so much more in those early seasons if people focused on her like a lot of times Rosie seemed to as well. So so another check mark for Rosie is she actually wrote stuff to to try to highlight a talented cast member who didn't always yeah get get lead roles I mean, a lot of her sketches have all the women on the show in them yeah kind of interesting like again i i think her the writing that she does not just for the two nerds but the writing she does for the mom for the jane Curtin character is incredibly good <laughs> it's incredibly smart is there anything else that you wanted to talk about as far as rosie's candidacy any any sketches characters? no i like I, like I said, I think what we won't ever know is what kind of stuff did she lob into other people's sketches that yeah. made them better, because, which I'm sure she did, right? But we can't, it's hard to ascribe. So it's hard to know the full measure of a person uh, in that way, other than to say, you know, there's only a core group of maybe like eight or nine people that really created that show from a writer's perspective, and she is one of them. And I think that's important. And I think like we, you know, we can talk about her, the sketches that she is attributed to, but just the fact that she was there with that group, one of the only, really only two women writers in that group surrounded by sea of men. And yet to a great degree, the first five seasons of SNL are pretty balanced with male and female kind of points of view and performances and performers. And I think she's a part of that. Right. So, you know, I think there's some heavy lifting going on there. So you don't think but, voters should just dismiss Rosie Schuster uh, when it comes time to cast not. their ballots, I mean, right? Well, like it's, give, it's, give her yeah, a chance. No, she's, she's absolutely worth consideration. I think, you know, it, the great thing about that show is it's so big and it's so expansive and it's got room for a lot of people to have really contributed. And I, I think that this is as, as strong a contribution as anyone has. So, yeah, I, I, I would have no reservations about her getting into the getting into the hall. I think she's well-deserving. <laughs>
So there's that. That was Maddie Price in conversation with Thomas Senna discussing the nomination of Rosie Schuster to the SNL Hall of Fame. Will Rosie pass muster? I don't know. I don't know. It seems to me thus far, results for writers are fairly skewed based on the fact that we just, you know, don't quite know what their day-to-day looks like. And every week we get to see cast members on stage and musical guests on stage. But the writers, we we don't see them unless they make a cameo appearance. And and then there's excitement. Usually there's excitement, you know, when a cast member make uh when a writer makes a cameo appearance. We're excited by that. Uh it's it's something that's neat. Uh Rosie is before that time though. And you know, uh, she's got a couple interesting things that might prevent her from entering the Hall of Fame, and that is uh, the the length of time to which we've uh, waited to nominate her, and uh, the fact that a uh, she's a writer, like I mentioned before, and um, yeah, it, it's gonna be it's gonna be a tough a, a tough sled, I I think, to get her in. But uh, if you're a fan, lobby, fight hard, go to social media and stick your head out the window and say, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore unless Rosie Schuster is in the SNL Hall of Fame. So there's that. Let's listen into her Hall of Fame sketch at this point now. This is... uh, a sketch that I think a lot of people thought was reoccurring. I know I did. Uh, I believe, though, the character has only shown up twice and only once in, in a sketch that featured him. And that is Fred Garvin, male prostitute. Let's go to it now. This is Rosie Schuster on the SNL Hall of Fame podcast. I'm coming, I'm coming. Hello? Mrs. Potter? Yes, that's me. The same Mrs. Potter who's vice president in charge of loans for the Franklin National Bank of Chicago? Yeah, that's me. Hey, this is for you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, may I come in? What for? Uh, well, you see, ma'am, when a VIP like yourself uh-huh. comes to Moline to do business, it's customary for the company to send a gal up to the room. Compliments of Great Lakes Feed and Grain. <laughs> and, well, since you're a gal, the company sent me, Fred Garvin, male prostitute. Uh, I, don't, I don't think you understand, Fred. I'm not uh, that kind of girl. Let me reassure you, ma'am. I can assure you yeah. professional hygiene Discretion and animal gratification. I have never had to pay for that in my whole life. Well, don't worry about it. Great Lakes Feed and Grain is picking up the tab. You've got me for the whole night. Hey, uh... Hey, hey as for uh, horses, young lady. Hey, no uh, ifs, ands, and buts about it. Mr. You're spending the night with Fred Garvin, male prostitute. <laughs> Well, now, I have a work order here which specifies that I am to Roger you roundly till 6.15 tomorrow morning. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, uh, don't I get a say in this? I mean, uh, maybe I want some sleep. Maybe I don't want to be Roger roundly. (laughs) Ma'am, you're dealing here with a fully qualified male strumpet. I service the entire Quad Cities area, Moline, Rock Island, Davenport, and Bettendorf. Why not give me a word? What have you got to lose? What do I have to lose? No one's ever going to know. And I'm not going to see Paul for another couple of weeks. Sure, he's not the most attractive guy in the world, but if he can make a living at this, he must be doing something right. Okay, Mr. Garvey. 
I'll try. Congratulations, Mrs. Potter. I know you'd come to your senses. And now, ma'am, if you're amenable, I'd like to begin the session by striking a few seductive poses. <laughs> Call this one the snake. Um, Fine then, if everything's going okay, you should be hotter than Billy by DB Dam by now. <laughs> well, I'm, uh. Oh, Miss I Potter, don't know about Please cooperate. This. Come on now, come on. You, you'll thank yourself later now. Come on. Let's get out of this bed here, young lady. Come on, come on. <laughs> hey, just jump right in here. Okay. Now, if you don't mind, I do work with the glasses and Jack. <laughs> Feeling anything yet? Any symptoms of arousal? I don't think so. Well, these things take time. Perhaps a bit of humor will break the ice. What's red and green and goes like this? I don't know. <laughs> a frog in a blender. <laughs> There you go. And now look at this. What's that? My backseat driver's license. <laughs> Enough foreplay. Let's get cracking. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. What? What is all that stuff you got? Oh, that, that's that's my rather elaborate network of trusses. Uh, I, I will need your help with a couple of these. I got a, uh, oh, I got the old hernia truss here. Uh, I got a spleen truss. It, it undoes with a couple of snaps at the back here. Go ahead. No, I don't think I'm. You know, uh, I think this is too much for me. I no, no, it's just a couple of snaps at the back. You know, you just got to make sure you, you you don't you don't touch the rupture. That's all. <laughs> Yeah, at the back. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh. Who's that? Who's that? It's Slick. Uh, it's slick. Slick. Yeah. Ah, this takes a little explanation. You see, Slick is a gentleman of leisure. Mm -hmm. he, he looks out for me and the girls. Uh, be there in a jiffy, Slick. Uh, by the way, one good word from you would really put me in good with the boss. Okay, Fred. Okay. <laughs> Hey, Slick. Fred, my man, man. I was down the hallway. I thought you might need some help with your trusses, baby. Oh, no, we don't need any help with his trusses. Uh -huh. In fact, I think maybe you both get better get out of here. What's the matter, then? Hasn't Fred attended to your needs? Oh, oh, no, he's really attended to my needs. He, oh, yeah? he, he was wonderful. The earth moved. <laughs> In fact, it moved so much, I don't think I could take anymore. Ha, 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 that's my Fred. Yeah, he's my bread and butter man. You see, in my stable, I got eight girls and Fred. <laughs> Come on, Fred, let's go, man. They got some hungry women down in Bettendorf waiting for the Garvin lizard. Fred, Fred. Fred, I, I just want to thank you for tonight. I'm never going to forget it. <laughs> well, thank you, ma'am. I do what I can. <laughs> because I'm Fred Garvin, <laughs> male prostitute. All right. Let's stop. That is a, a sketch, maybe a tad long. Maybe a tad long. But uh, I enjoyed it nevertheless. Rosie Schuster, everybody, give it up. And make sure to cast a vote for her when you get the chance in the SNL Hall of Fame balloting system. That's what I've got for you this week. I hope you're well. I want to thank Matty Price on behalf of my colleagues, Matt Ardill and uh, Thomas Senna. It's been a pleasure to be here with you this week, as it always is. Now, if you would do me a favor and on your way out, as you pass the Weekend Update exhibit, there's a light switch on the wall. 
turn it off because the SNL Hall of Fame is now closed. Thanks for listening to the SNL Hall of Fame podcast. Make sure to rate, review, share, and subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on social media at SNLHOF. This is Doug Denant saying, this is Doug Denant saying, see you next week. Podcasts and such.